In early 2019, 31-year-old Najir Parks was arrested for multiple crimes he didn't commit after police facial recognition software mistakenly identified him as the perp. His charges were serious, illegal possession of firearms, aggravated assault, and resisting arrest. Mr. Parks ended up spending 11 nights in jail and fighting a year-long legal battle to clear his name. Facial recognition technology is used more and more as an investigative tool by law enforcement, despite research showing black and brown folks are up to 100 times more likely than whites to be misidentified. Joining me now is Albert Fox Kahn, Executive Director for STOP, which stands for Surveillance Technology Oversight Project. The nonprofit advocacy group focuses on combating discriminatory surveillance practices. Albert, thanks for coming on tonight. Thank you so much for having me. So I started hearing more about facial recognition technology last summer during the height of all the protests taking place and that law enforcement were using them to surveil and target BLM activists. Then after catching major heat, companies like IBM, Amazon, and Microsoft made announcements that they weren't selling facial recognition services to state and local police departments anymore. Now, for those who may not know or understand what facial recognition technology is, Tell us how long it's actually been around and how, for example, law enforcement gets a match using the software. Yeah, I mean, the technology has been around for years. We've seen uh, primitive versions actually being experimented with for decades. And what it tries to do is, you know, automate the process of taking a photo and comparing it to a database and seeing who it looks most like. But we talk about uh, photos having a match, but really there's never anything that absolute they're building up this model, this, this guess of how good a, a fit is this photo for another one. And, and there are a lot of things that mm -hmm. can lead to the software getting it wrong. You know, sometimes it's the quality of the image, sometimes it's the angle that someone's photographed at, but all too often it's race. All too often, if someone is black, if they're Lat Latinx, they are going to face a much higher risk of being falsely identified by the software. And it's something that is unfolding every single day across this country, thousands and thousands of searches every year. Now, you mentioned uh, during the break before we came in into the segment that law enforcement targeted one of your colleagues who was a protester last year. Yeah, this is the amazing activist DREC. He uh, is a leader of Warriors in the Garden. He's on our community advisory board. And, and he's someone who you know, was photographed at a protest here in New York. He's a very visible protest leader. He was you know, uh, charged with these nonsense charges. You know, they alleged that he pointed a bullhorn at an officer. And, and in response to that, you know, they had dozens of officers locking down his block, drones, they had tactical teams, they had all of these different units. And you know, one of the officers was photographed with a facial identification section printout from the NYPD. And so it's one of these mm. things that when we're talking about the risk of error with facial recognition, we're not just talking about privacy harms, we're not just talking about civil rights. All too often surveillance is just the first step towards a SWAT team at the front door or even a knee to the neck. It is yeah. the, uh, the tool that connects so many BIPOC communities with police violence. No, absolutely. Well, cases like Najir is a clear example of how these matches are error prone and racially biased. And in response to his case, you said, quote, you can have people who are being sent to jail wrong, wrongly who never know that facial recognition played a role in their arrest. How can this tool for face identification, which isn't scientifically reliable and not evidence that can be admissible in court, be the sole basis to take someone's liberty in some cases? Yeah, this gets us into something called parallel construction. This is, it sounds really sophisticated, but it's not. This is when police officers will use one tool to track someone down, but they know it's not something that they can show to a grand jury. They know they can't get someone arrested on the basis of this tool. So they then, you know, backtrack. They find another justification for the arrest. Here in New York, you know, we run mm. close to 10,000 facial recognition searches a year. And according to the NYPD, there isn't a single one of these cases where that's been probable cause for arrest. But what you see in a lot of these cases is that you'll then have the NYPD going to some, a witness. And, you know, sometimes it'll be as straightforward as them texting a photo to a witness and saying, is this the guy? And someone says, yeah. 
and then that's your basis for the arrest. And so it's a very leading question. It, in, in some cases, we don't even think that they're actually showing this to witnesses. They're just doing that as a workaround. And, and so what you end up with is this tool that's driving mass arrests, but it's never actually being tested in court. It's never actually being analyzed by the judge. And it's never even something that most defendants know was part of why they are facing these charges. So, well, if prosecutors decide to utilize this tool to build a case against an accused, even if they never plan to use it in court, wouldn't they still be obligated to disclose the information to a defense lawyer under Brady? It, it seems like it's, there's a Brady issue here. There is a huge Brady issue, and this gets. <laughs> and part of the problem is that we don't think that you know we're seeing good faith compliance with Brady when it comes to a lot of these uh, technologies. That we see, you know, these just you know we'll, we'll hear from public defenders a lot that they'll have a case where they think that uh, facial recognition was used in their case, but they don't know because they uh, are being told that the reason, the stated reason uh, for the arrest was that an officer who had no, no connection to the case made a eyewitness ID of that person. So what that suggests to us is that you have cases where an individual is, is having a facial recognition search run. They're then going to someone who has a relationship with the person that the software is flagging and then using that person's word as, as the justification for a warrant application or the justification for uh, going to the grand jury. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're not seeing uh, Brady notification the way we should. And you know we've actually had some cases where uh, the courts have said that if you aren't actually seeing reliance on the facial recognition software to get the arrest warrant, if you're not seeing it introduced at trial, that there isn't even a chance to to attack the validity of it. Wow. Wow. So, so yeah. how do defense lawyers recognize cases where facial recognition was used in a way that can be challenged in court? Yeah, I, I mean, there's some amazing... Uh, defense attorneys here in New York who are challenging the way that NYPD is using facial recognition every day. Uh, I really want to shout out the work of the Legal Aid Society and Brooklyn Defender Services. And, and you know, sometimes you can just connect the dots. I mean, if you're being told that a detective reached out and found an officer who maybe arrested someone four years previously, and that officer had a, a eyewitness ID, uh, based off of, uh, you know, a crime scene image or something like that. If they're claiming that sort of fact pattern, it's kind of like hard to believe. How would that, how would they have known to reach out to that officer in the first place? There are a lot of cases like that where the fact pattern just doesn't make sense the way we're hearing about it. And, and you know, here in New York, we have to also highlight the fact that we have two separate facial recognition systems. We have the official one, but then we have this very uh, concerning system called Clearview AI, where you know dozens of officers uh, were able to sign up simply by contacting the vendor with an NYPD email address. And once you gave them that, that you had free range to use this system to run as many searches as you want. They were encouraging officers to run, you know, they, they said, don't just try one or two, try 100 facial recognition searches. And so here you have the vendors with a profit motive to try to get officers to use this technology more often. And really it's the wild west out there. And so this is what's going on just at the precinct level in addition to what's going on through our actual you know, uh, uh, forensic uh, operations. You know, I, I am just, I've, I was a criminal defense attorney for so long and I never, I'm starting to think back at cases now and wondering if facial technology was, you know, even used. Um, great information. Thank you so very much, Executive Director for the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project, Albert Foxconn. Thank you again. Thank you for having me.